Harding family has been a rich blessing to our church family, to so many of you, and so it's be a blessing to them as well, church, and, and imagine different kinds of ways that we can care for them sacrificially. Uh, it'll look different for different people, but I think it's something that we are all called to. Some of you will be serving in the children's ministry now. You're so convicted, uh, and others of you will be doing all sorts of things. One of the best ways that you can care for kids, by the way, is simply engaging them on Sunday mornings, talking to them, saying hello, remembering that they are the part of this body, just like everybody else. Our scripture passage this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The passage will be up here on the screen. If you have a Bible, we would encourage you to pull that out and follow along with us. This is probably the heaviest passage in the sermon on the mount, and since it's a heavy passage, let me just remind you that God says that the word that goes out from his mouth uh, will not return to him empty. It will accomplish everything that he purposes it for, and it will succeed in doing the thing for which he sent it. Praise God, we are, we are dealing with something, we are handling something that has so much power, and I think that is really helpful to remember when we deal with heavy passages. God will do what he will do this morning. If you're able to stand, please stand for the reading of God's word. This is Jesus speaking primarily to his disciples. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, this is a heavy passage. And so we do pray, Lord, confidently that your word would indeed uh, go out and do a miraculous work in us. We tend to have harder hearts than we'd like to admit when we approach your word, I think especially when we encounter passages like this. And so would you soften them, and may we leave here surprisingly encouraged in Christ. We love you, Lord, and once again, we love the Hardings so much. We love Philip. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7 mark the beginning of the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So we're, we're in the home stretch. And Jesus is going to make a bunch of summary exhortations, you might say, in the coming weeks. And man, what an encouraging word we have here from Jesus. Amen. If you're on the path to life, it's going to be really hard. And the alternative is destruction. So do you want, A, a lot of difficulty right now, or B, even more difficulty later. I don't know if Jay's in here. Jay, do we have a song for that? I guess we could cross over into the, to the top 40 world if, if we need to. I can think of at least, probably at least three John Mayer songs that would have worked really well here. And this challenges a lot of our contemporary Jesus categories, doesn't it? Especially if we effectively prefer Jesus as opposed to, you know, maybe the God of the Old Testament because we believe that Jesus is somehow warmer and more compassionate and so forth. Especially if we're, you know, maybe done with religion and done with the church, but still on good terms with Jesus because religion is about rules and exclusion, but Jesus always says very inclusive things. Those categories... And those bifurcations do not mesh all that well with Jesus' exhortation here in verses 13 and 14, at least on the surface. So it appear as though we're in for some stretching this morning. Not the, you know, goat yoga kind of stretching, where you, you actually, you probably listen to John Mayer, but the kind of stretching that Jesus leads us through here in the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe there were some goats in the area. I don't know about that, though, based on the geography. Probably not mountain goats, and definitely no John Mayer. And actually, I mean this very seriously, despite the very difficult thing 
that we're going to be investigating in a few moments here, I would not be surprised if many of you find this passage a lot more encouraging than you anticipated. So a reflection and then an exhortation this morning as we consider what we might label the most difficult teaching from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, although subsequent passages in chapter 7 might like to have a word with us here as well. But this is probably the pinnacle of difficulty in the Sermon on the Mount. So a reflection and then an exhortation. The reflection, everyone picks a gate, and then the exhortation from Jesus, by all means, please go with option A. Everybody picks a gate, go with option A. Let's start with that reflection. Everyone picks a gate. Look with me at the first phrase in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. Enter by the narrow gate. Surprise, we're not really entering the gate. We are entering something else via the gate. Perhaps some of you already knew that, though. You're, you're gate experts, and frankly, you're not surprised by any of this. So what is this something else that we are entering by the gate? If you've been following with us throughout our series in the Sermon on the Mount, you can probably guess what this something is. The something else is the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. Effectively, the same thing, the, the heaven language just emphasizes the kingdom place. And again, throughout our series, we've been emphasizing Patrick Schreiner's definition of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the king's power over the king's people and the king's place. We're going to come back to this narrow gate, in a moment, but notice that Jesus immediately introduces a second gate before he really gives us the main information about the first gate. Enter by the narrow gate, but there's also a second one. Enter by the narrow gate, but there's a second one. And where does this second wide gate lead us? See the rest of verse 13. Answer, not the kingdom of God. We'll end up in a place, but not the king's place, and we won't be with the king's people, and we won't be benefiting from the king's power. In fact, the path beyond this wide gate leads us to destruction. Because there's so much sensitivity and even controversy at times, concerning the precise nature of, of where these gates lead. It is so easy, church, to miss what cannot be missed in this passage. You will pick a gate, and there are two options, the narrow gate and the wide gate. Or to put a little bit more flesh on the bone here, everyone will respond to Jesus and all of the instruction he's been giving in the Sermon on the Mount. There's no middle ground. There's no Switzerland. There's no picking Blink-182 when you're asked to decide between NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. Narrow gate, wide gate. And the stakes are cosmically high, having to do with the kingdom of God, not boy bands from the 90s. And this shows us that Jesus is giving us far more than good advice. And it shows us that he's, he's far more than a sage. We live in such a commitment, allergic moment. We always want to keep our options open, and we manufacture ways to do that, even with our spirituality. Ways that, that on the surface sound so sophisticated and, and intellectual and, 
and well adjusted. We mix different spiritual streams together, taking what we prefer from each. Tara Burton, she covers this really well in her book, Strange Rites. And we usually pick things from these different streams that mesh well with wherever the cultural winds might be blowing. Or perhaps we might embrace universalism, which for many is effectively a way of embracing Christian, yet culturally suitable morals, often actually from the Sermon on the Mount, without making firm doctrinal commitments. Universalism permits us to embrace kingdom values without really embracing the king. A few months ago, Facebook removed, you'll be glad to know, I guess, I don't know, Facebook removed its religious affiliation category from individual profiles. If you haven't checked Facebook in like six years, well, that religious affiliation category is gone. And maybe they removed it because, I don't know, the programmers were exhausted. I mean, the drop-down menu had gotten longer than an encyclopedia. New options materializing daily in service of what I would basically call non-committal spiritualism. But according to Jesus, you can't not make a commitment. And there are two ways to live. You'll follow Jesus, and you'll live like it, or you won't follow Jesus. You'll enter the kingdom of God by the narrow gate, and you will find life. Or you'll turn aside from the kingdom via the wide gate and you will find destruction. By the way, lest we think that we have here some sort of brand new teaching from Jesus, he's really just elaborating on Psalm 1, a passage that we preached through this past summer. And there the psalmist, you might remember, contrasts the blessed and the wicked man, concluding at the end of the psalm that the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And very importantly, the righteous, this is so important, church, the righteous in Psalm 1 are not simply those who are, you know, doing good things for God and following the rules. The righteous are those who are delighting in the Lord through His law. Those who are communing with God and trusting, and then, like trees planted by streams of water, Psalm 1 says, they yield fruit in its season. And Jesus has been making a very similar point throughout the Sermon on the Mount, so let's make sure we don't lose sight of that point here in the home stretch. Jesus is not here calling. He is not calling for external behavior modification. He's not calling for an external righteousness. You know, judgment is coming. Better start doing a lot of really good things really fast. He is calling for something heart deep that comes, to borrow Jesus' language from John 15, which we just prayed through a moment ago. He's calling for something heart deep that comes from abiding in Jesus. He's calling, Matthew chapter 16, for his disciples to deny themselves and take up their cross for the sake of coming after Jesus and communing with him. And in church, as we deny and commune and abide, we bear the fruit of true righteousness and we flourish even in the midst of very difficult circumstances. Church, do you therefore see the goodness? Do you see the goodness of Jesus in being honest with his disciples about the gates and the path? Do you see how he's loving his disciples because of this honesty? Jesus, here's what Jesus says. Jesus is a shepherd who happens to care about the well-being of a sheep. And he guides them. He leads them to water. To pull from Psalm 23. 
You know, we might say to one another, you know, Jesus, this, this sounds, you know, sounds a little bit exclusive. Okay, fine. Be- but that's because, you know, the lake over here is, is full of cool, pure mountain water from the Rockies, and the lake over here is a Florida retention pond full of pesticides and algae that are baking at 91 degrees and remaining non-committal about the water sources isn't an option. Eventually you'll get thirsty, and then you will drink from something. And Jesus is here to tell you that even though the retention ponds are awfully convenient, there are over 70,000 of them in the state of Florida. If you're thirsty, you can find one. Even though they're so convenient, Jesus is here to tell you that the trek that you'll need to make to the Rockies is more than worth it in the long run. Bad shepherds, the kind of shepherds that are called out, by the way, especially in the prophetic literature, bad shepherds, they flatter the sheep, they disregard truth. These days, sometimes even they disparage the whole idea of truth in the first place as a power play. They disregard truth for the sake of being well-regarded and for being celebrated and for increasing the number of followers they have on social media. Good shepherds, conversely, they nourish, they guide, they protect. And that's what Jesus is. There are so many things that we could say in response to this, but prayerfully, as I was prepping this week, I felt the Lord urging us as a community to remember the urgency of, in the goodness of evangelism. How many of us, rhetorical question, how many of us would truly be willing to read or quote these two verses at any point to a neighbor or to a co-worker or to a family member? Not out of some sense of, of Christian obligation, but because we're convinced that it would genuinely be good to do so. Because we're guiding them to a path that we believe leads them to life. It doesn't matter how much pressure evangelism might come under. I'm tempted to say here in the West, but in other places you might get killed, whereas here I suppose you're probably more likely to be canceled on Twitter or something. It does not matter how much pressure evangelism might come under. God's word will bear fruit and change the lives. Isaiah chapter 55, 11, one more time. My word that goes out from my mouth, God says, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. That's always true. On Thursday, three of us from the mission's committee drove down to Orlando to attend Wycliffe Bible Translators Scripture Celebration. It's an event that Wycliffe hosts twice per year to celebrate Bible translation projects that have been completed around the world in the past few months. Before the celebration, we toured the Wycliffe Discovery Center, and our host, the person who hosted the tour, she introduced herself like this kid you not, beginning of the tour. Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm from China. When I was a teenager, I became a Christian, which was received very poorly by my dad, who was an atheist, and by my mom, who was an idol worshiper. And then she said, but I continued in my faith, despite the chilly reception, and now they're both Christians, too. That's how you begin a tour right there. And that's what God's word does. I want you to know that, and not just know that intellectually, but believe that. It accomplishes its purpose. And it bears fruit in impossible places. Sure, some of us might need more training in evangelism. I get that. 
Maybe we need new opportunities. But I honestly think that the, the thing most of us need is encouragement. I think most of us, what we really need is a warm hug from the Lord. So be encouraged by Veronica's story. Be encouraged that the fastest growing churches in the world right now are in places like Iran and Pakistan. It is worth it to exhort people concerning the kingdom of God and the life that is found there eternally. Even if we're in a moment in which many people don't care so much for this kind of two paths and only one leads to life kind of talk. It's still worth it because everyone will travel, one of them. How do we exhort? How do we exhort? We exhort like Jesus, boldly and truthfully, yet with so much love and compassion and patience. You see this quintet everywhere in Jesus' ministry. We exhort with boldness and truth, but also with love and compassion and patience. And listen, we're, we are all aware of evangelism that has looked absolutely nothing like that. But instead of being done with the whole enterprise, we lament those examples, we, we course correct, and then we carry on. The spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6.12, love it when the faithful followers of Jesus throw the baby out with the bathwater. But church, which path are we on? We were just talking about evangelism. We were talking about people that need to hear this news concerning the kingdom of God. But what path are we on? We can't possibly end our time this morning without putting the spotlight on ourselves, actually. Which brings us to the exhortation I mentioned earlier. Go, by all means, please, take Jesus' advice. Go with option A. Option A is the hard way. Verse 14. Access by a narrow gate. Verse 13, then repeat it again. In verse 14. Hard and narrow are essentially synonyms here. Narrow referring to the difficulty of entering the gate compared to the far wider, more spacious gate associated with the path that leads to destruction. So here's the thing, if you are searching for the kingdom of God, pack lightly and expect a lot of bumps. Earlier I mentioned Matthew 16, 24, which talks about denying ourselves and, and taking up our cross if we desire to come after Jesus. And then things get even spicier as you continue into verse 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Entering by the narrow gate is not a morality contest. We're not starting at some sort of start line and saying, who can do the most good works? It's not a morality contest. But the entering certainly involves denying ourselves and losing our life and so forth. I was thinking about this week, it's kind of like walking into an airport to catch a flight. You start, when you go into the airport doors, you start with a whole bunch of bags, but by the time you're going through security, it's, it's just you at that point. You know, even your carry-on is going through the little, the little luggage car wash. And you don't even have your shoes on, unless you're one of those fancy travelers that has pre-check or clear. I, the point is, I don't have what that is. <laughs> and that security gate is a bit narrow isn't it? Especially the old-fashioned metal detector one. You can barely make your way through it. When we decide to follow Jesus and give our lives to him, he does a whole lot of weaning. And the way that this gate leads to remains hard as the weaning continues with more longevity and intensity than you ever imagined it would, to be honest. 
And remember the Beatitudes. Remember this, this intro to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We saw, we saw at the very beginning of this series that disciples of Jesus should anticipate all sorts of difficult circumstances along the way, sometimes on account of following Jesus. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. But in those Beatitudes, Jesus comforted and encouraged his disciples by telling them, listen, there are going to be some very difficult circumstances. Some of you are experiencing them right now. But listen, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Looks at them and says, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Your reward is great in that kingdom. And then here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, Jesus, he, he encourages us in the very same way. Yeah, the gate is narrow. And the way is hard. But it leads to life. It leads to life. And we are talking about eternal kingdom life. In which all of the hardships associated with, with the way we're experiencing right now come to such a glorious end. I know that many of you are really experiencing the, the narrow and the hard parts of this way right now. Perhaps the countercultural experience of following Jesus is, is wearing on you a bit, sacrificial living and generosity. They look really cool on paper, but they're really taxing at times and on some occasions even catalysts for cynicism. Is this really worth it? And mind you, I, I don't think it's going to be getting any easier to be a faithful Christian in the near future. I could be wrong, I would like to be wrong, but I'd guess that the bumps experienced on account of following Jesus will become more frequent or more pronounced. But I want you to know that it's worth it. I want you to know that it's worth it because it's the path to life. And remember once again that the guy who's giving this sermon was himself taking the hardest possible path. So hard that it's going to lead him to the cross, that he might be made sin by the Father, even though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we might be able to come after Jesus in the first place, denying ourselves and surrendering our lives to him, and so walk the path that leads us into the kingdom of God. So we're not being invited onto a path that Jesus is unfamiliar with. In fact, he knows it better than we ever will. And then as we walk that path, we live the kinds of lives that Jesus has been preaching about. Righteous lives that indicate we're following the king who makes us righteous before the Father. And church, I want you to know that the other path, Jesus says, leads to destruction. The gate is wider. It's far more accessible. It doesn't involve the kind of Jesus trusting, lose your life so that you can find it self-denial that we see described in Matthew chapter 16. It's honestly the gate that will enter by default because it's the path of least resistance and it's far more comfortable and, and very often it's actually celebrated. So no wonder many people, Jesus says, enter by it. I'm not so sure how much we're supposed to read into this many language as far as a comparison to the few that enter the narrow gate, especially because plenty of people have and will enter the kingdom of God by the narrow gate. Church, God is not stingy, and there's a description from John in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, in which John looks during his vision and check this out. He beholds a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The heart of God certainly is not, well, let's just limit the number of kingdom people as much as possible. That's not the character of God. The least we can say there 
is that the wide gate will always be plenty popular. It won't tend to look like the kind of gate that leads to destruction. And in fact, and this is very important concerning the the tone of the Sermon on the Mount, in fact, there's plenty of room on this destructive path for people who are doing good things that have all of this external righteousness, who really aren't following Jesus and communing with him. There's room, tragically, for people practicing an external righteousness who haven't been captured by their need to be represented before the Father by the perfectly righteous King. The path will be inhabited by people who really don't understand their need for grace. You'll notice in verse 13 that Jesus doesn't really give us a definition for destruction. The book of Matthew includes several statements from Jesus that reinforce the idea that we discussed earlier, that this destruction is effectively the converse of being in the kingdom of God, what we often refer to as hell. Remember that we just saw the word hell back in chapter 5, verses 10 Sorry, verses 22 and 29 and 30. And then that word actually comes up again, Jesus' words, each time in Matthew chapter 10, 16, 18, and 23. The hard path is so, so worth it. And I want to end with this word of encouragement. Even though the path is hard now, God is still good in the midst of it. And he is present with you. And you know what? Experiences of genuine joy are totally possible along this path. You do not have to wait until you gain the heavenly kingdom to experience genuine joy in the Lord. After the Discovery Center tour that we took at Wycliffe. We attended the actual scripture celebration service. And at one point in the service, we saw a video that documented a very unique translation project for a language that's spoken in Eritrea. And also the language, of course, since it's spoken in Eritrea, it's spoken you know, among those who live in the Eritrean diaspora, which has grown significantly in the past 15 to 20 years to various civil conflicts and things like that. So it's a unique project because a team of people from the Eritrean diaspora in the U.S. and Canada has been working on the New Testament. Many of them lived in refugee camps in Ethiopia for years, Ethiopia borders Eritrea to the south before immigrating to the U.S. and Canada. They're working on the New Testament, that team, and then another team of people from the Eritrean diaspora has been working on the Old Testament, and all of them are currently living probably permanently in Ethiopia. So you have Eritrean believers in the U.S. and Canada, they're working on the New Testament, and you have believers in Ethiopia working On the Old Testament, they use all of this elaborate software to share notes and to check each other's work and so forth. So we watched this video, and then after the video, onto the stage walked Johannes Matthews, one of the translators spotlighted in the documentary who lives in Ottawa and works on the New Testament project. And here's what Johannes told us as we... He began his update about the translation project. I, I went back and actually watched the video, which I would encourage you to watch this. If you, are, if you are down as a follower of Jesus, you want to be encouraged, go watch the scripture celebration. So I went back and watched this video just so I could get the wording right. Here's how Johannes introduced himself. The minute he got up onto the stage, he said this. He said, God is good. He is still working. I am from Canada, Ottawa, Ontario. I moved to Canada in 2006 after living six years in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. In other words, he left Eritrea around 2000 
and then six years, refugee camp. And he said this. He just looked at us. I think this was unplanned. <laughs> he just looked at us and he said, you know, God has been good in the refugee camp. God has been good in the refugee camp. God has been good to me when we crossed the border into Canada to live in Ottawa. And he's continued to be good to me as we've tackled this translation project. If God can be good in a refugee camp church for six years after leaving your home because of extreme danger and then good again when you move halfway across the world, if he can be good then, I feel really good about telling you that he can be good to you now, regardless of the circumstances that you might be facing and the circumstances that you will eventually face along the hard path. Amen.